These are 67 broken things that Mojang accidentally added to Minecraft. Starting with this creepy change that they added to the clouds. Since in 20w22a, there was a glitch where if you logged into your Minecraft world with the clouds turned on and then turned them back off, and if you do that correctly, the clouds should stop moving on screen. That is, until you move. At which point they'll follow your every movement precisely. Which is more than a little creepy. I've heard of the hills having eyes, but I guess the clouds do too. In snapshot 21w08b, you didn't have to use a budding amethyst to get more of this stuff, but instead by placing in a piston facing upwards with a slime block on top. All we had to do was line all faces of that slime block with a corresponding max amethyst chunk, so that when we activated the piston, it would duplicate all of the shards. Which, if you need a lot of tinted glass, could come in handy. But I can't say the same if you need a lot of spy glasses, because those are barely useful when you have one of them, let alone 65. Did you know Mojang made it so creepers can't explode at all? It's really no joke. We're just gonna have to go up to the build limit to test it out. Since in current versions of the game, if you were to get a creeper or an exploding TNT block up at Y level 320, then at that build height, they're not able to destroy any blocks. And the reason for that is that when the game checks to see if the block has the right resistance, it just returns null. After all, you're not supposed to be able to place blocks up here, so why should it explode? And that means all explosion spread is nullified as well. Back in Bedrock 1.19.2, if you were to place down any block in the middle of the water and then throw regular glass on top of it, then when you look through that glass item, it'll render the water behind it as completely transparent. And the same would also happen if you had an armor stand hold a glass block like this. And I think when Mojang tried to make this block transparent, they might have gone a little bit too far. But hey, it's handy for finding buried treasure. I must be a bad trainer, because no matter how many times I try to tame wolves, I can never get them to sit still. Though the reason for that might just be because when you summon a wolf on top of a slime block and then tame it, you can't actually get it to sit down, since the way that the slime block works, it's a little bit less than a full block size. And that confuses the wolf's hitbox so that it sits down and then stands right back up. I can't say I blame them, I also don't want to sit down Nickelodeon gack. When you take a strider outside of lava, it's supposed to get cold, but when you put them in powdered snow, then they get warm again. At least that's how it happens on bedrock. Which, even trying to think of a lore reason for why this happens now, none come to mind. They drop string, not leather, so there's no way they're safe from this. It's just a bug. In current versions of the game, it's still possible to open up a shulker box, even if it's gonna collide with a block. And folks, the number of blocks this can happen with is too long to list off here. Really, just place any of these next to a shulker box, open it up, and you'll see something that looks far from intentional. But perhaps the most interesting is that it also doesn't break the blocks that it interacts with, which is nice of it. It only breaks some rules, not the annoying ones. If you were to plant a mangrove propcule and then build a 9x9 cube solid of mud blocks above it, then when you use bone meal to grow that tree, you notice that this is a rare case where the mangrove tree will actually destroy any mud block above it. Which, this is really just left in as a holdover so that the mangrove tree can grow its roots down into the mud below. But mud above the tree? That's a rare case, so I don't blame Mojang for not checking for this. The only time you really put mud in the air is so they can dry it out on a dripstone. Here's how to use a bundle to duplicate all your diamonds. All you gotta do is lay out 9 diamonds diamonds in the crafting table to craft a diamond block, and then use the bundle to pick up the individual items in the crafting table. At that point, we still have our nine diamonds in our inventory, but the diamond block will remain in the crafting table. And now we went from nine diamonds to 18, giving you a short track to the new richest person on the server. I would just suggest moving. I don't think the IRS takes kindly to diamond duping. Who would win in a fight, the Ender Dragon or all these wardens? Well, it's confusing, which sounds like a cop out, but when you look at it, the wardens will try to attack the Ender Dragon, but no matter how many times they use their base attacks or the Sonic boom, the Ender Dragon still doesn't lose any health. But more fascinatingly is that if you have all of these Wardens here, then it's also possible for the combined force of all their Sonic Booms to knock the Ender Dragon way out of course. And at that point, they didn't kill it, but they certainly weren't nice to it either. I guess we can call it a draw. Let me ask you this, can a firework hit an Enderman? It's a weird gray area. Since when you shoot a firework rocket out of a crossbow, it is a projectile, but it also does explosion damage. Which things like TNT and Creepers still can damage the Enderman. But as you can see in the test, it just doesn't do anything to the Enderman. They'll teleport away and no damage will be taken. But more confusing that the wiki says this still works. And at that point, I don't know where the bug is. Is it supposed to work? Is it not supposed to work? Even the bug tracker still says it's unconfirmed, so who knows. Here's how to survive the void in survival mode. Since unlike in Java, if you play in Bedrock Edition, there's actually an invisible floor that exists right on top of the void. So if you were to give yourself plenty of enchanted golden apples and ways to stay alive, then when you drop down onto the void, you can actually still walk along the floor. Not that it's an enjoyable stroll, but it's better than dying outright. The way that banners render in Bedrock it's possible to place a banner down in water and it'll be completely visible from up top. Just you know, soggy. If you were to have a named bow or crossbow in your offhand, and then use that to kill another player, then regardless of if it was the bow that actually did the killing, the death message will still say that the damage was done by the main hand weapon, which can get pretty confusing when you look at it. And considering how much tougher it is to get a kill with the offhand weapon, it's a shame the credit gets stolen. But I guess there's a reason we call one the main hand, one the offhand. Life isn't fair. In Java Edition, the way you stay safe around a skulk sensor is to walk along on wool. But 
from bedrock, that's not an absolute. Since if you were to step down from one wool block onto another wool block, even though both of those aren't supposed to send up vibrations, somehow the act of changing your footing is enough to trigger it, which can be a big problem if your redstone contraption triggers at the wrong time. It's not much of a trap for your friends if you end up trapping yourself. The way that Minecraft loads the chest that you find inside of shipwrecks, it can sometimes cause quite a bit of lag, which is usually the result of the game generating the map data for the map that you find inside, but lag it out at the wrong time and you could just end up with a completely blank treasure map, which speaking from experience can lead to some frustration. Unfortunately for us, spyglasses don't have a cooldown time, which sounds great, so where's the problem? Well, when you try to spam click a spyglass like this, you'll see why I'm so hesitant, since the end result will be this very disorienting visual effect. Honestly, we should just slow down the footage to show you, since having to go through this real time feels like you're being punished for something you did in grade school. Not worth being put through. When you place down a block inside of a bubble column in Bedrock Edition, then there's a chance that that block will appear as if you waterlogged it, even if it isn't a waterloggable block. And that's easiest to see with glass like this, but it can also work with other blocks like honey blocks. Though, keep in mind, this is just a visual bug. You don't actually have an aquarium there. When you log out and log back in, it'll just disappear. Here's how to use a cake for infinite redstone. First, place down the cake, and then place a block in front of the cake. After that, if you place a comparator with redstone dust in front of the block, you'll notice that when you eat the cake, you'll have created an infinite redstone signal. And the only way the comparator will turn off is if you update the block. So, uh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> if you change your game mode to survival right next to a wither skeleton, then you'll have confused it so much that you're in this weird limbo period between creative mode and not, which means that its arms just go between not wanting to hit you and wanting to attack you like this. And to me, it seems like they're trying to figure out if you're friend or foe, but if you get close, they definitely choose foe. So even if it looks weird, keep your distance. Here's how to turn your strider into a ride or die. Since back in snapshot 20w13a, there was a glitch that was added in where if you jumped on a strider and then had a fungus on a stick to guide yourself, then once you angled yourself against these blocks, that would actually allow you to travel 10 times faster than you normally would. Even the strider looks confused, and I can't say I blame it. Luckily, the nether doesn't have any speed limits that I know of, but even if it did, you'd be moving so fast, you'd be able to avoid those laws anyway. What's stronger than bedrock? Yeah, I was confused too. But back in 21w05a, Mojang mistakenly made it so that you could actually place a drip leaf underneath the bedrock block, that when you then use the bone meal to grow the small drip leaf plant, then the big drip leaf grows to destroy the bedrock, which is just great. It's strong enough to break bedrock, rock, but not strong enough to hold a feather. Minecraft, never change. If you were to place fences underneath the end portal in the stronghold, then when you drop any kind of falling block like sand or gravel on top of it, you'll notice that when you jump through to the end side of the portal, you'll be collecting duplicates of that same block. Though to do this, the falling block has to fall from more than six blocks above the portal. You fail to do that, and you'll just be stuck with a singular sand block. And that's just sad. For a brief time in history, Mojang added water to the nether, and then quickly removed it. Since what happened is when they coated it so that you could waterlog glow lichen, they forgot to make the distinction for lava. So once you put glow lichen inside of a lava source block, it would turn that lava into water. So if you want to make the nether safe, spend as much time in this version as you can. You never know a good thing till it's gone, I guess. If you place down a pad of slime blocks like this, with a boat down in the center, then in bedrock, after enough jumps, you'll have actually stored so much potential energy in the boat that when you sit inside, you'll launch off into the sky. And better yet, it'll launch the player higher and higher each time that you enter the boat, which we thought was a glitch, but maybe it's just an early look at the Swedish space program. And looks a lot cheaper than what we try in the US. Might be worth something. Apparently, it's possible to stack enchanted books, which is a weird sight, but let's explain. By putting two books enchanted with a curse in the grindstone, it allows you to stack them instead. And this is because you can't remove curses with a grindstone, so it just glitches out the output. And then, you can shift-click out the end result, and it'll put them all back in your inventory. This fence will keep your animals trapped, but lets us jump over just fine. See, if you arrange the shape of trap doors flipped up like so, the mobs register it as a block from this side to jump in, but they can't jump out when inside. Which means that the next time that you go to check on your chicken coop, you don't have to worry about one of them escaping when you open up the gate. And it'll work just as well for monsters as it does for animals. But I'd be sure to keep your distance away from the creepers. Have you ever tried sprinting backwards? Well, it sounds crazy, but with a glitch, it's possible. See, the community's found a way that if you sprint and then immediately jump in the opposite direction, you can actually sprint backwards on bedrock, which can come in handy when you need to escape from a primed creeper explosion. Just be sure to be careful not to run into any unwanted chasms. Did you know that horses can move this fast? Well, when you give potions of swift and jump boost to your horses, they get temporarily faster as expected. But if you breed them when the effects are still active, they pass those attributes onto their offspring. And folks, those are permanent. So if you continue to do this for generations, their speed and jumping ability will only grow over time. And as you can see, that can make for some pretty wild results. In Minecraft, there's knockback, knockback 2, and then the kind of knockback that launches you 1100 blocks away. 
Thanks to the community's discovery, it turns out that by stunning a Ravager in a build like this, and then sitting in a minecart above, we can get launched hundreds of blocks away from the location. And if you're looking to extend that airtime, maybe bring an Elytra as well for an even greater liftoff. Fall damage is one of the most common ways to die in Minecraft, so we're often looking for ways to avoid it. But while that's usually done through the help of water buckets, it turns out that powdered snow might be the best option. And a big reason for that is this glitch where we can land on a carpet on top of powdered snow blocks and not take any fall damage, even though it's covered. Let us not only create virtually invisible landing pads, but also build them in the nether. And that's a lot more robust than the water that we're used to. The redstone community is one of the cornerstones of Minecraft. And for good reason, they do a lot of great stuff. But it's weird to think that so much of the community, at least in Java, is built around a glitch. The community calls it quasi-connectivity. And what this refers to is a bug in the code that allows for a piston, as well as dispensers and droppers, to be activated when blocks directly above them or diagonally above them receive a redstone signal. Even if they're not getting one directly, which sure enough means that we're able to power pistons like this, even if it doesn't make direct sense. And if you want any further proof that this is unintentional, it doesn't exist in Bedrock Edition. It's just the job of people who get to play around with this. And for all of you playing Bedrock, I hope for your sake it gets added intentionally someday. One of the monumental discoveries that shape the landscape of Minecraft Redstone has to be these block update detector switches. These bud switches, as the community likes to call them, are such an essential way to how we play the game. I mean, up until 1.11, it was the only way to tell if a block got updated. And folks, it doesn't take a lot of redstone know-how to see just how useful one of those could be for farms. Which is why, luckily for us, Mojang added these in officially through the form of observers. Now, that's not to say that the original bud switch isn't still in the game. As you can see here, both are working the same way. But what we do have here is convenience, which I think is how Mojang actually sought to replace it. Because if you ask me if I want to build this whole circuit or just place down one of these blocks with a face, I'm definitely taking my option with the straight face. Now, of course, with Minecraft's wonky world generation, you're sometimes going to see non-flowing water. But that's not all that exciting, because as soon as you block update, it's just going to pour over. That is, unless you use this trick using seagrass and bone meal, because apparently that bug hasn't been fixed yet. With a setup like so, you can place a water bucket at the top of a two-block structure, and then throw in some of that seagrass right there at the bottom and bone meal it. Just like that, remove the blocks on the sides, and you got your very own non-flowing water. And while that's cool, that's not even the last part, because as you can see, no block update is actually going to get this to flow over. Somehow, the seagrass just keeps it all in that one cubic meter. So is this game breaking? I guess technically, but it's not exactly overpowered. Anyone who's ever messed around with the enchanted books in Minecraft knows that certain things are mutually exclusive. So, for example, the way that it is in the current versions of Minecraft, you can't put together all the protection types onto one piece of armor. But strangely so, for a brief period of time back in 1.14, that wasn't the case. So after it got reported in the bug tracker, most people thought that was the end of it. But that's not the end of the story. Because as you can see, if you made this armor back in 1.14 and then just continue to play through all the different versions of Minecraft, then as it goes, that armor didn't get updated, and it still functioned as a piece of armor with all the different protection types. So if you played Minecraft back in 1.14, you definitely have something to show for it. Unless you build something in the spawn chunks, then most of the time, it's not going to get loaded if you're not there. At least, that's how it was supposed to be. Clearly, there were plenty of different unintentional methods to do this. And while most of us thought that every time one of these popped up, Mojang was just going to squish it like that, strangely enough, it actually became an intended feature through the help of nether portal chunk loaders. The setup that we have here is super simple. All that's happening is that an item will get sent through the portal every 300 ticks. After that, the item comes back, and then it goes through an infinite loop of loading the different chunks. In a lot of ways, this isn't too far from the way that it worked in bugs in the past. And I think I speak for everyone in the technical community when I say that there was a lot of rejoicing when we knew that this was in the game to stay. While the 1.14 Village and Pillage update brought along a ton of new features, one of the famous ones was crawling. Which is, if you set yourself up like so, normally through the help of a trap door, you can actually crawl in one block spaces. This is very cool to see, and while you could say that it was based on some of the different modded implementations in the past, as it turns out, it really came into play when 1.9 brought along the elytra. There, you could pull it off as some form of side effect, which was pretty neat. And then, when we had swimming introduced in 1.13, there was multiple different ways to pull it off. It just made sense to add it into the game. Thankfully, now we have a fully intentional way to get into our one-block spaces. And more importantly, I think we really gotta pay respects to 1.13 and 1.9 for helping along with this. While blaze spawners make for a pretty popular way to get plenty of EXP in the nether, anyone who's ever messed around with a fully automatic gold farm knows that the zombie pig 
piglins can offer their fair share. But one of the reasons for that actually bases around a glitch. You see, many people know that the way that their aggression system works is that when they get attacked, they actually get the other people around them angry as well. But what's interesting is that if we kill some of those auxiliary aggro pigmen, even if we don't touch them at all, they still drop EXP. And this is what allowed us to make fully automatic AFK gold farms for EXP in the nether. And now for the foreseeable future, this is now working as an intended mechanic, which is great for both us and our mending tools. If you've ever messed around with the different world generation settings, then you're all too familiar with the idea of an amplified terrain. And if your computer can handle it, it's definitely a spectacle to go and fly around one of these things, which is why it's all the more curious that something so beautiful was created on accident. As Jeb describes, while working on some terrain generation, they accidentally messed up the coordinates. For a long time in Minecraft, boats have been somewhat of a laughing stock. And while Mojang has thankfully ironed out the rough spots to make these work better in water, if you've been playing Minecraft long enough, then you know that they do their best work on an ice highway. This method makes for one of the fastest ways to travel in the game. And while their odd propulsion might seem like it's working unintentionally, according to the words right out of Mojang themselves, it actually is working as intended on the bug tracker, which is definitely fortunate for us and for our nether hubs. Because now we get to travel those thousands of blocks in the overworld, not only with style, but also with plenty of speed to back it up. It's weird to think about that when elytras were first added into the game, there wasn't a way to make them fly. Rather, they were way more of a gliding technique. That is, until players found out the unintentional way of putting their bow to use. As you can see, when you're flying around with an elytra, all it takes is hitting yourself with a couple of punch two arrows, and boom, you're flying off into the indefinite. Now, even if we wouldn't exactly call this a bug, it definitely wasn't what Mojang had in mind. So, as a response, in 1.11 snapshot 16w50a, that's when we got the intended way of doing this, which was of course firework rockets. And thank goodness for that, because the last thing I'm trying to do while I'm exploring my world is land a couple of bullseyes on my head to keep myself going forward. Minecraft's world generation can famously lead to plenty of weird and wacky sights. And among those, arguably the most common one that you're gonna see is different floating sand and gravel blocks. Now of course, these are supposed to fall to the ground. You can see that when you block update them. Now initially, this was treated as a bug, because obviously that's not exactly what you hope for when you make a world generation engine. But later on in a Minecraft's life, Mojang made the very clever switcheroo of making it an intended feature. Because as you can see, if we just add in dust particles falling from the floating blocks, now it's alerting the player of a cave-in. Repackaging this bug is way more of a mechanic. And honestly, while I still think these blocks being suspended in air is pretty silly, I have to commend Mojang for their different way of looking at this. Item duplication is normally a conversation that's sure to split a couple of players into different sides. But while I'll leave that discussion for them to hash out, I think the form of item duplication that most of us are totally fine with comes from one of these, a TNT duplication machine. It still hasn't been patched out, even though Mojang fully knows of it. Because the way that the story has gone so far is that Mojang has patched it out in the past. But since in the Java edition there's currently no way to make movable tile entities, meaning that you can't move TNT dispensers on a flying machine, there's no intended way to replace what the TNT duplication machine does. And honestly, if I've got to give up my TNT duping fun to have movable tile entities like chests and dispensers and droppers, I'm completely fine with that. Since the 1.16 update, the nether has been a lot more dangerous to traverse. But while we do have new hostile mobs in the way of piglins and hoglins, there is a glitch that might help ease the pain. Now, to pull this off, hold up your shield the second that you go through a portal. Then, after the dimension loads in, you'll find yourself on the other side virtually unchanged. However, the game keeps your shield held up even while you're attacking or sprinting, meaning you can fight mobs as usual while still blocking their attacks. Now, the glitch doesn't allow you to eat or place blocks while you're doing this, but the other payoff is pretty worthwhile. Minecraft has a surprising amount of flying mobs, but while we're all familiar with blazes, phantoms, and bats on that list, there are two unlikely candidates that also fit. Even though a strider doesn't seem much for aviation by itself, these things can actually be persuaded to the skies. Through the help of a fishing rod and a scroll wheel, all it takes to do this glitch is switching on and off of the item rapidly in your hotbar. And bam, just like that, you can fly, or at the very least fall with style on the back of your strider. And hey, the same even goes for pigs and carrots in the overworld though they'll have a rougher landing than the Strider does. Elytras are a great asset to have, but having to beat the dragon before you get one could be something of a hassle. So if you found the end portal and want to jump to the good stuff, all you need is a piston to make it work. As Mr. Cat shows, pushing yourself with a piston underneath the portal is enough to teleport us to the relative coordinates in the end. So if you got a slow fall in potion and a handful of ender pearls, we can quite literally find the end city loop before even attempting the dragon fight. Keeping monsters away from your base is a big problem to solve. And while there are simple solutions, like constructing a 
big wall of blocks, those aren't always the prettiest. So thankfully, these azalea bushes do the trick just the same. No joke, in the current versions, it's possible to place down a ring of these bushes, and that alone will stop the monsters from getting any closer. Which is ridiculous for sure, but it's hard to criticize something that works this easily. And hey, it'll give you an early start in building a hedge maze, for what that's worth. Snow golems make for great friends, but they are the best protectors. And really, unless they're attacking blazes, these snowballs are not good for much. Though if we take some blocks from the nether, we can effectively turn that around. See, in bedrock edition, these snowball entities work fairly different, letting them even catch on fire when thrown like so. And that can let us turn our snow golem palace into vicious flamethrowers. If you ask me, that's a welcome improvement. So if you make sure no mobs can jump in and kill them, this might be the best way to defend your base. Seeing through walls would be a superpower that most of us would love to have. But Steve isn't exactly Superman, so the idea is a pipe dream or it would be if we stayed at this FOV. See, the way that field division works in Minecraft, if you drink a speed two potion and then turn your slider up to Quake Pro, then you can get some really wide vision. And then all it takes is lining yourself up next to a wall and the job is done. So if you suspect that your friend might be hiding things around your base, this might be the perfect shot to find it. And it'll make Green's job of hiding his even tougher to do. As it is, even if we drink a fire resistance potion, we still can't see through the burning magma. But that all changes when we add a slab to the mix. Now with this half block, we can simply swim underneath and hold the jump button to see through the lava layer. And while this seems like a natural fit for the nether, it even works in the overworld, making diamond hunts even simpler. Spawning into a new world should be a positive experience. After all, it's the start of something fresh and exciting, so that's gotta count for something. But in this case, it's more of a rude awakening than a clean start, since on this seed, we just so happen to spawn right on top of a cactus of all places. And I don't think I'm out of line by calling that a bad spawn. So if you wanna start out your world with a depleted health bar and a bad attitude, I guess this does the trick. <laughs> whatever that's worth. Finding a reliable fuel source in Minecraft is a tough concept. Whether it's charcoal or blaze rods, these farms take a lot to get up and running. And while the 1.17 update should have made the choice obvious, unfortunately, we still aren't able to take lava buckets out of the lava cauldrons, making renewable lava farms a far cry from automatic. So if you're fed up with all that setup too, then these carpet machines might be the easy way out. Make no mistake, this is item duplication. But if you're cool with that, then this newfound carpet is sure to keep your furnaces up and burning for the foreseeable future. Elytras are great for flying, but hovering, not so much. Which unfortunately makes these really impractical for any kind of precise action like building or mining. But if you're looking to keep the precision of pillaring or bridging without leaving anything behind, then scaffolding could do the trick. And no, not like this, but rather like this. You see, if you spam right click enough on the top of a scaffolding stack, you'll eventually see a floating bit off in the distance. Now, this isn't a real block, and it's only visible on the client side, but you can walk on it just the same. So if the server has flying enabled, this can clearly help out for manhunts or master building. In a lot of ways, single player can be a much riskier operation than a server. At the very least, you've got no one else to blame if something goes wrong. So say you're playing by yourself late one night and happen to stumble into a nether river. Now the situation does look pretty dire, but not unsalvageable. You see, one major exploit in the single player system is the ability to pause whenever you like. And that's where the saving grace comes in. By quitting and rejoining constantly, you can use the brief seconds of spawn protection each time to maneuver yourself out of the situation. Is it cheating? Sure, but hey, who said exploits have to be fair? Hidden doors are a very slick system to show off in your base, but the standard levers and buttons make for a pretty bland input to use. So that's where we need to get creative and resort to this classic bit of knowledge. Arrows and Endermen don't mix, meaning you can't even land a shot on it if the mob was stuck in place. So if we were to tuck the Enderman in a minecart like such, you notice how any arrow shot at him will physically bounce off and even go through walls. And if we happen to tuck a target block behind that very wall, then this becomes our brand new button and quite the spectacle too. One of the often unseen limitations to Minecraft is the idea of the entity cramming limit. And while most of us don't breed enough cows, sheep, or villagers to see this, there might be a practical use if you come close to that number. As you'll see, there's a certain amount of force given to the player when another entity pushes them. And this can get really obvious in a one by one crammed hole. So if you were to take a chunk of these mobs, fill up a space, and then start jumping with an elytra, then their small pushes might be just able to give you enough momentum to rock it out of there. Making this both the weirdest and the most effective elytra launcher I've seen seen. Roller coasters are a great thing, but powering a minecart is not an easy or cheap task to fulfill. So instead of wasting hours away in the caves hunting for gold and redstone, why don't we find a cheaper motor up here on the surface? And for that, it might be time to fire up the villager breeder. Now, I've talked about the benefits of mixing boats and minecarts plenty of times, but we can actually take it up a notch by adding a villager to that very boat. At that point, the cart keeps moving along a great speed on that track, allowing you to hitch a ride without ever running up the cost to go with it. 
While Minecraft might not have the most accurate physics engine on the market, there is one thing that's true in game and in real life. You can't walk through solid matter. Or can you? Now, surely you can't do it like this, but with the help of shulker boxes, the line gets a lot more blurry. Since these containers expand their hitboxes when you open them up, we can use that to push ourselves through solid walls. Place the face in this way, open it up, and find yourself squeezed out on the other end. And you can even use this for hidden floor entrances like such. Just leave a gap underneath and a block over top, and you'll disappear in a pretty sneaky fashion. Shit. Starting a farm is a slow process, and while bone meal might help you cut down on the growth cycle, it can still be a pain to break the crop and get a measly return. Though, if we look over to Minecraft's loot tables, we might be able to tip the scales. You see, the way that the Fortune 3 enchantment works, we can even see the benefit when we break our carrots and potatoes. So, sure enough, the next time that you go to harvest, maybe bust out the Fortune 3 pickaxe instead of your fist. Just that simple change could net you an extra item for each crop planted, which, trust me, adds up. Looting 3 is an amazing enchantment, which makes it a real shame that Mojang only intended it for swords. Though, even if Mojang intended it one way, that doesn't mean we have to play by those rules. Through the help of the offhand function, it's possible to throw a ranged weapon in our second hand and still have the looting enabled. From there, whether it's instant health on a bunch of zombies, a bow for creepers, or even snowballs on a blaze, the looting enchantment is applied just like the sword. And better yet, no damage is actually done to the looting weapon, letting you get away scot-free and still benefit from the tool's power. If you don't have an ender chest, then hiding your valuables is a tricky bit business. And while we've talked plenty about the creative ways to stash your loot, this might just be a new favorite. While playing in Bedrock Edition, if you push a block into a chest minecart, then, even though it's still there, you can't see the entity. And here's the best part. We can open it up just the same. Just make sure your crosshair lines up like such where you can't see the outline of the block, and then you'll be safe to tuck something in the bookcase and know it's safe and sound. Beacons basically define the later stages of the game in Minecraft, but what these are good for in haste, jump boost, and speed, apparently they lack in regeneration. Now, that's not to say that they don't give regen, clearly they do, but a glitch in the code prevents these beacons from giving the full regen after activated. So to change that, we can fix this glitch with another exploit and use this system to deactivate and reactivate the beacon for a faster regen. Going from a full regen of 72 seconds with the normal one to roughly 51 seconds with our modified. So if you're looking to save some seconds next time you're in danger, then this workaround's what you need. If you're not prepared, the wither can be a tough boss to fight, but one of the biggest pain points to fighting this thing is just how destructive it is. So if you're looking to score a nether star without leaving behind a giant crater, then I suggest we take this dilemma to the end dimension. Here, we can dig ourselves the perfect spot to fight the thing, and that's of course, right underneath the dragon's fountain. Down there, if you summon a wither like such on the ground, then it'll spawn inside of the bedrock barrier. And from there, you could choose to let it suffocate or attack to your heart's content, both for an easy win. Let's face it, there are a lot of benefits to going on top of the nether roof. You could build gold farms, nether hubs, and all without burning in lava. But even though it's nice to be on top of the world, some things only exist in the dimension below. So to fix that and bridge the gap between the two, a classic solution is to break bedrock like so. If we manage to pull together some TNT, pistons, and plenty of trial and error, we can break through the unbreakable block and reach the underworld below. Though, just remember where in the roof you came in in the first place. Otherwise, you'll be breaking a lot of bedrock, only to find more bedrock underneath. And portal frames, much like bedrock, are supposed to be unbreakable. Though, just like bedrock, that unbreakable tag is really just a suggestion, not much of a rule. And sure, while we could in theory break these the same way that we blow up bedrock in the nether roof, a much simpler option is finding some fungus and some bone meal to do the job. If you sprout up a big red mushroom like such next to the portal, you can wipe out three frames at a time, all while keeping the actual portal intact. No joke, it even works if you get all of the portal frames busted, letting you design your own portal frame and then some. Finding buried treasure in Minecraft is easier said than done. Now sure, it's easy to find the buried treasure maps themselves, since they stick out in big sunken ships, but actually finding the place where X marks the spot, it's not as simple. And while there are plenty of little tips to help you pinpoint it, if you're on bedrock, the solution is as simple as a riptide trident. By launching yourself into nearby walls in the sand bed, you can glitch through the blocks and find the chest just like that. Is it the most practical method? I'm not entirely sure. But when it's this ridiculous, I'll gladly take another excuse to use my trident. Bedrock Edition is known to have more than a few quirks in its code, and while some of those can be infuriating, others are just hilarious. Like how you can make a fully functioning zip line in your Minecraft world. No joke, if you start swimming in a water column and then step out, you'll still be swimming even in midair. From there, give yourself some chains as a ceiling, and you can sail along this without a care in the world. Granted, you'll need to make sure to have blocks above your head to stay in that state, but that's a simple trade-off for the chance to break the game's physics engine. And with that, folks, YouTube thinks that you might like this video, so see if they're right and have a good one, all right?